Old Testament reading this morning is Psalm 22. So I'm going to ask you to please turn with me in your Bibles, if you have your Bibles this morning, to Psalm 22. A lot of uh, scripture reading this morning. And then we'll go over to Romans chapter 11. Psalm 22. Um, Obviously, you know that this psalm finds its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ at the cross as he's dying for our sins and providing atonement. And he's providing atonement for all of his people, all of his people he's called out of Israel, all his people he's called out of the world. And that's what makes this psalm so wonderful. It goes to all the nations, to all of his people. So Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning, oh my God, I cry all day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. To you they cried and they were rescued. In you they trusted and they were not put to shame. But I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by people. All who see me mock me. They make their mouths at me and they wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from my mother's womb. And you made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you I was cast from birth. And from my mother's womb you've been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls have encompassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all of my bones. They stare and they gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, you praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. For he is not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when we, when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All ends of earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him, shall bow down who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the congregation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness as a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Amen and praise God. Now let us turn to Romans chapter 11. And beginning in verse 11, and Paul is speaking of God's grace of grafting in the Gentiles. Paul says, so I ask that they stumble in order that they might fall by no means, rather through their trespass, that's of the Jews, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, when speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order to somehow make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. 
For if their rejection means a reconciliation of the world, what would their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so was the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But some of the branches were broken off. And you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishment, in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it's not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you'll say, the branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Well, that's true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what was, for what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? Amen and praise God. There's a lot there this morning. Let us pray then. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you so much, Lord, and just pray that you would give us wisdom. Help us, Lord, enlighten our eyes to understand your precious word, to know that you are sovereign God, almighty God, and holy God. I pray that you would truly bring us understanding. Help us, Lord. Help us to be convicted where we need to be convicted, to turn to you, Lord God, to be encouraged, to be comforted, to be strengthened, Lord, to rely and to rest on our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen and amen. All right. Praise God. This whole section from chapter 9 through chapter 11, Paul's big concern is for his people, for ethnic Israel, for, for the Jews around him, the unbelieving Jews. Note that. The unbelieving ones. And trying to answer the, well, answering the question, why, like, relatively so few have come to trust in Christ? And we talked about election. So we've really been talking about God's sovereignty, God's plan in that way. And then the question becomes, is God through with ethnic Israel? And that causes a lot of consternation among many Christians. I think Paul's answer is clear here that no, emphatically no. I mean, he is praying for his kinsmen according to the flesh. He wants to see more of the Jewish people come to faith in Jesus Christ. So his answer is no, and that's for sure. Now, does Paul teach and does Scripture teach that a true Jew, the true and the true Jew in the truest sense, is that person who's been converted to Jesus Christ? Yes, and absolutely. So true Israel are the believers in Christ. So how does he deal and how does he fit these things together? And that's what we've been working through and seeking to figure out as we go through this section of Scripture. So two big ideas I want you to see. Number one, Israel rejection. Paul is teaching that Israel's rejection of Christ at that time, by and large, will lead and has led, has in fact led to the salvation of the Gentiles. The door's been opened wide by God's grace, in God's time, in his planning to the Gentiles. So part of the Jews saying no to Christ at that time and by and large rejecting him has been beneficial to us, to you that are sitting here today, because the gospel has gone out to the nations. Now, in fact, it's always been part of God's plan. This isn't plan B. It's not plan C. It's not plan D. It's always been part of his plan, but this is how it's been working out. So in Genesis 17, verses 4 to 6, it goes way back. The Lord says, Behold, my covenant is with you, as he's speaking to Abraham. You shall be the father of a multitude of nations. Not just one, but a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you the father of multitude of nations. Which in its fullest sense is he's the, the father of all the believing out of all the nations of the world. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. Psalm 22, we just read from, remember towards the end of the psalm, he says, 
All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All the families of the nations shall worship before you. So all the believers from everywhere around the world will come to him. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. In Isaiah 49, verse 6, the Lord is saying, Is it too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob, to bring back the preserved of Israel? I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Then we come to the New Testament in the book of Acts, chapter 8. After persecution, what do the Christians do? Did they just fold their tents up and go home? Oh, we're being persecuted. That's it. It's over. It's done. No, when they were persecuted, driven out of Israel, what did they bring with them? They brought the gospel. So now those who were scattered went about preaching the word of God. They didn't stop preaching. They brought the word with them as they were going from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends, to the remotest parts of the world. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them Christ. And then Acts 11, 1, and then 17 and 18. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of the Lord. And verses 17 and 18. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who... Who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. So you see that fullness of salvation. It goes out. It's for all of God's people. So God's not failing with Israel. He's actually fulfilling his plan of redemption. Let that sink in for just a minute. Let that sink in for one. most of us, if not all of us here. Is anybody Jewish background here? I don't know. I don't even think so. So that means that all of us here this morning are a testament to this very thing. Isn't that amazing that the gospel went out? You're here today because of this. The Jewish Messiah is the savior of the world. And part of that's because that hardness of the Jewish people rejecting Christ, Paul's teaching us here, has caused the gospel to go out. And we're beneficiaries of that. If you're a Christian this morning, you praise God, even in his sovereignty for salvation in this way. God's not failing, but he is fulfilling. Second big idea, and I want to really focus in on this today, is that the salvation of the Gentiles now was hopefully, hopefully, used to wake up the Jews. And that's Paul's hope. Listen to what he says. He wants them to, the, he wants the, the realization that Jesus is the fulfillment for everything that Israel hoped for. So as they see the Gentiles turning to Christ, hopefully they're, they're becoming a little jealous and saying, wait, wait a minute. That's what we had. And we kind of let that go and, and we want that back. So look at verse uh, 11 and 13 and 14 in Romans. Paul said, so I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, that's the Jews, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. And then down in 13 and 14, now I'm speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order to somehow make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. Do you see the love that he has for unbelieving Israel, for those who are not calling on the Lord at this time, for those who have rejected Jesus Christ? He has that love. So when you see the jealousy there, though, don't you get like, make them jealous in that way? That's, does that, when we think about jealousy, you know, say, what? Jealous? You know, that's not something we want to, listen, not, it's not always wrong to be jealous. Just like Luke said, it's not always wrong to be angry. There is such a thing as righteous anger where the Lord is vindicated. There is sinful anger as well. There's sinful jealousy. There's also a sense of righteous jealousy. It's good to be, how do you, how would you feel like if your spouse didn't care at all about you? Then it doesn't matter what you do. Who cares? Oh, so what? Um, no, that's not, no. There's, there needs to be something where they show that care and that, that respect and concern. Now, on the negative side, the sinful expression of jealousy, that's often associated with the inappropriate or disproportionate overreaction to attention that someone or, you know, something is given to you in that way, that someone's giving to you. Right? So you know about the stereotypical jealous person. They're so jealous. You know, my husband or my boyfriend or my girlfriend is so jealous. You know, they go into this rage and they're always afraid and they're so insecure and, you know, they're unpredictable and sometimes even violent. You're so jealous. How, why are you like that? You know, you know, that's, that's, 
that's not the kind of jealousy we're talking about here. There is a positive aspect and a good aspect of jealousy, and that's associated with guarding. When you love somebody or you love some, you're going to guard that. You're going to protect that. You're going to be jealous of, for that in, in a good way where you're making sure, where you're caring for, you're invested in, you're loving, and if something's threatening that, then you're going to act. And you're going to stand up for that. See, we're told in Scripture that God is a jealous God. And not this raging, anger, insecure. No, he's jealous for his holiness and his righteousness. That's why we worship him rightly. That belongs to him. He's owed that and he protects that. As a Christian, if you're a good Christian, if you love the Lord, then you're jealous for the things of the Lord, aren't you? You want to protect sound doctrine. So when somebody comes along and starts teaching falsely, you say, well, wait a minute. That's not true. Here's what the Bible actually teaches, because we're jealous for that. We want to protect that. We're caring for it in that way. So it's not all bad. Paul says, I want to make them jealous. In some ways, it could wake you up to realize what you had. Or what you let go of, right? Let's just say you've been taking your spouse for granted all these years. Now paying attention to your spouse, apathetic towards your spouse, paying little attention to your spouse, not really care. And then all of a sudden somebody comes along and even in a proper way starts showing attention to your spouse in a nice way talking to her, talking to him. just It doesn't have to be inappropriate, just even in a, in a proper way. And you see your spouse kind of light up and, you know, this attention is given to, to, to her and, and that respect is given to her in that way. And then all of a sudden, what do you do? You start to realize, wait a minute, that, that's my wife. That's my husband. And maybe I have been taking her for granted for too long. And so, so I'm going to change my ways. I'm going to realize what I have and what I had before it's too late. That's what Paul's kind of talking about here. He wants those people to see what they had, who they have in Christ, and what they've taken for granted. So there's little doubt that many of the Jews thought that they had an automatic, authentic relationship with the Lord. But why? Because they were born into the covenant. It happens with many people today. You're born into the church. You're baptized into the church. You do all the things that you're supposed to do. So you just kind of take it for granted. You don't have that heart and love for Jesus Christ. you never really seen your sin for what it is and how deep is grace and love mercy run for you. So, so you just kind of take for granted this relationship with God because you're kind of born into it. When that happens, eventually, 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 you're, you're going to become apathetic. You know, you're not going to care too much to cultivate that relationship and to love the Lord if you're not truly converted or truly trusting. You tire very easily of God. Oh, he wants me to do this. I don't know if I could do that. You know, you, you become lazy in your relationship with the Lord. But now, if you see that those who are really far off coming near to God, all that they had... The Jewish people had the oracles, the covenants, the law, the prophecies, the pictures that pointed to the promised Messiah, now being enjoyed by the Gentiles, by these people who were like enemies. Who are these people? Why, why are they being brought in? We're the ones that had this. I might say, some of them are going to say, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's my God. That, those are my, those are the covenants that I have. And now these people are brought in. That's fine. But he's, our, and that's what Paul is saying here, that some of them might be jealous in that way to realize what they had, what they've taken for granted so long, what they let go of a long time ago and come into a true and authentic relationship with their Lord. That's Paul's hope for the Israelites. That's Paul's hope for his people. And then in verse 14, he says, in order to somehow make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. Who are the some of them? Those are the elect, those who would be saved. That they would come to faith in Christ. See that? See how that works? So when you hear that jealous in Scripture, don't go right to the bad as, oh, that's a jealousy and that kind of thing. No, no, no. He goes on to say, or back in verse 12, he says, now if their trespass means riches for the world, because the gospel's going out, if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? So he's talking. There's hope there that they're going to come one day. They're going to come en masse to the Lord. That's how much it means for us because they rejected him. How much more is it going to mean for them when they receive him? Again, he's talking about unbelieving Israel, Jews, ethnic Jews who are not trusting in Christ. Full inclusion, 
listen, that's mere religious outward obedience can never provide that. You can't provide full inclusion, all the benefits of what it means to be truly converted, truly saved. You can play the game all you want. You can go to church, go to your meetings, do this, that. But if you're not, if you haven't repented, believed, received Christ as he's offered in the gospel of Christ, you will not know this. Okay? You will not have full inclusion. Now, what full inclusion doesn't mean when it comes to Israel, we're going to talk about this next week. It does not mean, I'm very emphatic here, it does not mean restoration of Israel as a theocratic nation. And that's a big divide among even many Christians. Okay, that's that's kind of an area where you know it gets a little 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 difficult at times. Back in the land, yes, we'll talk about that. Many saved, yes, over time, all at once. That's a question. But not a full restoration back to a theocratic nation. But by full restoration or full inclusion means into the body of Jesus Christ. That they have all the benefits. See, you could be Jewish, have all the outward, but you don't have the true benefits of what it means to be a believer. Just like you could be in church, you could have all the outward benefits of being in the covenant, but not truly have him. Full inclusion means you have him. And that makes everything else that we have, all the benefits, real to us in that sense. We understand what it means to be saved. We understand what it means when we come to the Lord's table and partake. We understand the means of grace that he's given to us in that way. That's full inclusion. Jew and Gentile together compose the one people of God. That's a big deal. Okay, we'll talk again more about that next week. I do want you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2 as we're talking about the one people of God. And I want to read beginning in verse 11 from Ephesians 2. He begins speaking to the Gentiles who were far away, but now they've been brought near through faith in Christ. He says, therefore, remember, Gentile, at one time, you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, that would be the Jews, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you at one time were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Strangers and aliens to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near, how? By the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of the commandments expressed in the ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, we are one in Christ, making peace. It might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. He came and he preached peace to those who were far off, that would be the Gentiles, to those who are near, to the Jews. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for the Spirit of God." One people of God, the church. We don't have two separate people. We don't have two separate plans. We have one people of God. Now, that doesn't mean that God is completely finished with ethnic Israel. Paul goes on. He talks about the uh, example kind of, of of the olive tree. Verse 17, if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although, speaking of the Gentiles, a wild olive shoot were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember, it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, the branches were broken off, so that I might be grafted in. That's true. They were broken off because of unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but faith, but fear the Lord. So what he's saying, what he's saying here, he's using the, the illustration of a, of an olive tree. And we'll speak more to this again a little bit more next week. And, and scripture, uh, olive branches, olive trees, they speak to different things, to peace, to healing, to comfort, but it's also used for the nation of Israel itself. One example is in Jeremiah chapter 11. The Lord says, the Lord once called you a green olive tree, beautiful with good fruit. Now, they're under his judgment at this point. 
But with the roar of the great tempest, he will set fire to it and its branches will be consumed. The Lord of hosts who planted you has to decree disaster against you because of the evil of the house of Israel and the house of Judah have done, provoking me to anger by making offerings to Baal. So they were being disobedient. They were going to Baal. They were under judgment. But here he's using the nation as an uh, olive tree as an illustration for that. So it does speak to that. It speaks also of unbelieving Jews were broken off because of their unbelief. Now listen, the true Israel is not something you can be part of merely outwardly. It's always inwardly. And this is what we say. Who's true Israel? Who's the true Jew? It's those who truly believe in Christ. True Israel was always those who truly trusted, who would be converted, who looked forward to Christ, those who by grace believed. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 2, 28, 29, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, the essence, the core of it. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart. So that's if you truly believe. That's why I say a true Jew is a believer in Christ, because you're trusting by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. The Gentiles were grafted in. Amazingly, we enjoy the benefits of salvation, pictured in the Old Testament ceremonial law, never attained by trying to keep the law, but by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ. So what are the implications for us? Here's what I really want you to hear and listen to this morning especially. As followers of Jesus Christ, if you truly believe him, you are considered a Jew in the truest sense. And that's absolutely what we read. And, that, and that's throughout um, the, the New Testament especially. Philippians 3, 3 says this, 3 and 9. For we are the true circumcision. He's speaking to the Christians. Circumcision was for the Jews only. He says, you're the true circumcision. That's our heart being circumcised, truly believing in Christ, who worship in the Spirit of God and take pride in Christ Jesus, put no confidence in the flesh. And I may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own, which is derived from the law, trying to get it, trying to work for it, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. You see that? That's who we are. This is, that is the true Jew. The so true circumcision. First Peter 1.1 1, 1 tells us, and then uh, 1 and 2, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are the elect exiles of the dispersion, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God, for the fa- God of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for the sprinkling with his blood. So who's he talking to in that letter? He's talking to the elect ones who are dispersed. He's talking to the church. He's talking to believers. And then he goes on in chapter 2, and he says this about the believers. He says, you are a chosen race. Now he's talking to the church, not just physical Israel. He's to, to the people of God. He's saying, you're a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession. Now, that was a word used for Israel in the Old Testament. Now he's talking about Christians and believers. This is who we are. We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is why we say it's not replacement theology. We're not, you know, doesn't church. We're fulfilling what God has planned for his people throughout the ages. That's what this is. That's why we call ourselves, in that sense, uh, the truest of Jews in that way. Galatians 3, 7 through 9. Know then that this is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, that's us, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, Those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So we're not spiritualizing, but we're pointing to the spiritual reality of who we are in Christ Jesus. Do you understand that? That's it. This is who we are. This is a a, a big deal for us because it gets very touchy. And I think these sermons are a little time, are very timely because of the situation that we're living in today. You know what's happening in Israel. You know what's happening over there. You know the Jews have been brought back to the land. You see the Jews under pressure and under attack. That's not a new story. 
So how are we as Christians supposed to react to that? Oh, just that, well, God's all done with that. There's no place for us at all in that way. Listen, Paul's admonition, Paul's admonition to us calls for great humility and gratefulness and an attitude towards all people, but here specifically towards the unbelieving Jews. 18 and 20, he says this, don't be arrogant toward the branches. He's not talking about believing Jews. He's talking about the nation of Israel. He's talking about the ethnic Jews in that way. Don't be that way. If you are, remember, you're not the one who supports the root, but it's a root that supports you. Don't be arrogant towards them in that way. We, as Christians, like Paul, ought to have this kind of disposition. Remember, back in chapter 9, Paul says, I'm speaking the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites. He's not talking about believing Jews. He's talking about unbelieving Israel in that way. And he has that desire to see them come. Don't get the idea that it's strictly sentimental. Oh, this is my tribe. It's my family. It's my ethnicity. Like I would say, I wish all of Italy was saved. In that. It's not merely that. It's not just ethnicity, but it's because of their role within redemptive history and how God used them. There's a place for that. There's, there's honor in that. And we see that. And that is borne out throughout history. Because I know people, we have our different views on Israel. Oh, it's nothing at all today, or it's highly exalted and, and much more than it ought to be. But what should our attitude be as Christians? I think Paul's telling us right here, especially when so much of the world, so much of the time, simply despise the Jews. It's just a fact. It's just a fact. You could trace it through history, right? And we have different reasons for that. Are they still under God's judgment or this or that? You know, we could talk about that, but it's very clear throughout history there's been this inordinate almost type of hatred for this people. Go back to the Old Testament. What happened in Esther? Esther chapter 313. Letters were sent by the couriers to all the king's province with instructions to do what? To destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, young and old, women and children, in one day. The 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. Now, does that sound familiar at all? Does that ring a bell? As of like right now, what's happening today? Think about the Babylonian captivity, 586, where all the Jews, Jews were deported from Israel into captivity for 70 years. And it wasn't just, oh, they just kind of left and just went out. No, no, no. Many, many were killed, plundered, and destroyed in that way. Think about A.D. 70, 70 A.D., what happened to Jerusalem. The temple was destroyed. The Jews were scattered from Israel in that year, from 70 A.D. till when? 1948. So all that time, there was a, a scattering of the people that Paul is talking about here, in that sense. He's not talking about the theocratic age. He's talking about ethnic Jews. And since that time... That's why they called them the wandering Jews, you know, from one place to the next. And time and time again, they would see mistreatment in many, many lands. It's just a fact. And it comes right back. It's a very strong proof of the truthfulness of Scripture and, and redemptive history. You know, the Jews are pl blamed over the years for so many things, and they were persecuted for it. And again, I'm not sitting up here sympathizing in an inordinate way. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just saying these are the facts. So when the Black Death came, when the plague came, many blamed the Jews for that and persecuted them. It was their fault. The Inquisitions, here the Roman Catholics, thousands and thousands of Jews were made to be baptized or they would be persecuted, some would be killed, others would be deported. Just as a nation, it goes on and on. Martin Luther, the who we admire so much and have so much to be thankful for, how the Lord used him in the Reformation. Later in his life, he hated the Jews. He liked them at first, but you could read his books, especially the one book that he wrote. It's hard to read. It's hard to read the words that Luther wrote regarding ethnic Israel and what he said about them and the words he used and what should be done to them. 
As a matter of fact, it was Hitler that used rationalized, used Luther's writings to rationalize what they would do to the Jews. It's not, that's true. So, so you see, if Paul's pleading for that, what, what should our attitude be? The Holocaust, the genocide, six million Jews killed. And that's part of the reason the nation of Israel was formed. And I know all the geopolitics and everything. We're not going to get into that, certainly. But just saying. See, Paul's saying here, don't, don't you be arrogant with the branches. Okay. And you're going to see next week that God has, there's hope for great revival among the Jews. What's going on today, right now, as we're living, as we're talking right here with Islam in Israel this time? In the so-called modern age that we live in, we're so advanced and everybody's so tolerant and everybody's so respectful. And what about the hate crimes? And nobody should, you know, talk about any other race, ethnicity, color, nothing like that because, you know, that's, that's wrong. That's racist. That's sinful. That's bad. Okay. Relatively speaking, very little sympathy for the atrocities that took place on October 7th have been seen around, around the world. You're seeing just the opposite. Well, maybe they deserve it. You're seeing huge, huge rallies and so-called or demonstrations where they're saying from the rivers to the sea. Do you know what that means? That the Jews need to be annihilated. They need to be killed. They take pride in what they're doing. There was, there were, there were those who went over on October 7th that were taking movies, sending them back to their parents and saying, see, look what I did. I killed five Jews today. Okay. This is the, this is the reality. And Paul's saying, don't you be arrogant toward those branches. Because there's something, there's just a natural antipathy at times, a deep-seated disdain when it comes to these people, isn't there? Stuff. Remember this. Do not, you are grafted and do not be arrogant towards the branches. Now, I'm not saying we favor one lost group over another. They all need the gospel. But let's be mindful and let's have the attitude of Paul, who said, I love my brothers in the flesh. I would give my own life for them, my own son, if they could be saved. Because of the dignity, not on a personal level, but God chose and used them to bring forth his salvation, to bring forth the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. You understand? We need to have the attitude of a Kori Temboom when it comes to Israel. She's the one who hid the Jews during the Second World War when the occupation came to the Netherlands. Unlike many others, she took Jewish families in and hid them at the risk of her own life, while many others were keeping, many other Christians were keeping silent or even turning them over to the authorities. We need to be like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was a vocal opposition against Hitler's genocide of the Jews. While many of the Lutheran pastors kept their mouths shut and didn't say a word, and even worse, were complicit. You know what happened to Bonhoeffer, don't you? He was hanged, eventually. We don't treat them like de facto Christians like so many do. We don't want to do that. That's not what we do at all because they're not de facto Christians. We don't exalt them as, this, oh, just a special people, like exemplary in this way. No, no. We see how God used them. And we don't despise them or show indifference either. Listen, we need to make them jealous, as Paul says. Jealous for Christ, to know Christ. And we do that by living faithfully as Christians, by loving, by witnessing, by showing the promise and fulfillment. We have that perspective. We have much common ground with Jewish people, don't we? 39 books. So when they are reading their, their scripture and we're reading the Old Testament, we're reading the same scripture. You can't say that about us in any other religious group. What we need to do is to show them Christ patiently, with humility, and with grace. Show them Christ from Genesis to Malachi as the Lord gives us opportunity. Show that the seed, Christ is the seed of the woman of Genesis. 
that he's the Passover lamb of Exodus, that he's the high priest of Leviticus, that he's the prophet like Moses of Deuteronomy, that he is the kinsman redeemer of Ruth, that he is the king of kings. He is the Lord, my shepherd of the Psalms. Christ is the wisdom of Proverbs. He's the suffering servant of Isaiah, the son of man of Ezekiel, the faithful husband of Hosea, the Lord who comes to his temple in Malachi. Every single book in the Old Testament pictures Jesus Christ. And that's where we need to be and what we need to remember, what we need to show forth as the Lord gives us opportunity. We must not be arrogant toward the branches. Whatever else is going on, we must not be. Now, next week, we're going to do, we're going to conclude this as we look at the rest of chapter 11 and see what the Lord has for ethnic Israel.